All right, why don't we get started um, and we'll go in the order. My name is Georgia Warnke. I am the director of the Center for Ideas and Society and I'm going to uh, try to host this meeting, although my, um, despite teaching online, my Zoom skills are still rudimentary. So we'll try to do this as best we can. Um, and uh, we're going, if you could, uh, I think there'll be um, a small enough number that you can raise your hand or you can submit questions by chat. Um, and um, yeah, I think that's about it. So turn your mics off while you're listening and then turn them on when you uh, want to say something during the Q&A. Um, and I think we will start with Sumeria, who's under the flag of Catherine Henshaw today, because we had trouble getting her into the uh, session. But um, why don't, let me admit two more people and we'll do the best we can. All right, you're on. <laughs> do you want to share you. your PowerPoint? Yeah, I'm sharing it right now. Yeah, I think everybody can see it. Okay, yeah. let me start. <laughs> The 21st century has created a new wave of environmental disaster fiction, a movement which sets out to rethink the narrative texture of present in the shadow of eco-catastrophe. Oh. Yeah. Rafaela Becker-Lenny claims that dystopian fiction is to warn readers about the possible outcomes of our present world and entails an ex extrapolation of key features of contemporary society. Sarah Hall's Daughters of Nerd 2007 is a dystopian response to climate change and economic collapse caused by global warming and human capitalist attempts and pressures. The title of the novel Daughters of Nerd becomes a reference for the title of this city as Daughters of Earth, referring to a group of women who refuge to the nature of Gaia as a symbol of mythological mother goddess. I use father title as a symbol for the dictator regime called authority, the American regime forces in the novel, which rules to Britain after environmental collapse. So I examine the novel through the lens of battle between nature slash mother earth and capital slash patriarchal father authority. In this article, I call Daughters of North a green dystopia as a reference to most common names for the time of new epoch, Anthropocene, Capitolocene, and Tulocene. Hall's novel portrays a green dystopian Britain which is collapsed as a consequence of climate change, social and environmental corruption, political and economic breakdown due to patriarchal oriented capitalist destruction and war. But it regreens hope through a rebellion revolt of women living in a pastoral landscape. I argue that green dystopia means green within dystopic feature that becomes a utopia within dystopia or hope in the dark. As the main character's sister in the novel says, quote, the only thing left for me was to hope. It was hope that nourished me day after day, unquote. Since 2000, the present geological time of Earth has been called Anthropocene by Paul Christen, a Nobel Prize winner attributing the term to Eugene Sturman, who coined it in the 1980s. The apocalypse epoch engaged with the climate crisis, which coincides with environmental collapse. Anthropocene as a name for the epoch transforms into the cultural concept and influential argument in terms of nature and society duality. Paul explore, explores the dystopian potential of Earth's transition rapidly and irreversibly into the state of unknown in human experience, because this contemporary imaginative fiction is haunted by prospects of planetary death or ir irreversible environmental disaster. The novel depicts uh, that after the collapse, natural sources are depleted, pollution reach the peak point, seas are submerged by deadly fluids explained as, quote, we crossed the swollen brown water of Eden after the electrical grid had powered down and darkness was spreading over the town. The flooding was worse around the bridge, unquote. Even the rain is different now, erratic, violent, not the constant gray diesel of old postcards, jokes, and television reports. It's rain that feels wounded, unquote. 
The massive flaws hit the most important symbol at place of the power and authority, the houses of parliament, as a foreshadowing that this woman army will hit the house of the authority. Code. Not long after that, Thames' flood barrier had been overwhelmed and tidal water had filled the building, I mean the house of parliament. Authority controls reproduction by requiring that every woman of childbearing age is fitted with contraceptive coils, IUDs, with only some enabled to re reproduce via lottery. The non-name narrator called Sister escapes from the reproduction lottery to the isolated northern urban, urban farm inhabited by the woman army community called Carhulen. Sister called unofficial by the authority is a rebel fighter and the last woman covertly escapes from the repressive regime of the authority and joins to the women commune rebels, the Karhulian army who are hiding in pastoral settings of the northern upland. On her way, the nature that Sister encounters portrays the collapsed environment. Both women's bodies and the natural body of earth are controlled by the authority. Just as women's fertility is restricted, nature is turned into petrochemical and black turned land. Sister cannot recognize the yellow-eyed, red-beaked birds and plants. There were dead bulbs in the soil and the roots of drowned plants. The only place where there is freedom for women and their bodies is Kahulian, which is peculiarly cultivated. So Sister's name is absent, representing the absent nature after the disaster of climate change. Quote, my name is Sister. This is a name that was given to me three years ago. It is what others call me. It is what I call myself. Before that, my name was unimportant. I can't remember it is being used. I will not say acknowledge it. It's gone. You will call me sister. Uncle. We see a transition from a forgotten dark, dark nature of father authority, where sister also prefers to forget her name and oppress identity. So the utopian nature of uh, the farm of the daughters of Mother Earth, where sister narrates her story with an independent, strong, superior, and collective sisterhood identity. Jason Moore claims that capitalism is a time of economic and technological power that distorts nature. That's not only humans and society, but also capitalism is responsible for the environmental crisis. Why anthropism puts human in the center, capitalism puts capital in the center, destroying the earth. The biggest global concern in the modern world, which is the age of capital, is the world ecology of power, capital, and nature, he says. Moore calls this conceptual thinking as green arithmetic formulation. Thus, society plus nature equals history. Today, it is humanity or society or capitalism plus nature equals catastrophe. Unquote. Paul's green dystopian future depicts the case of catastrophe caused by the effects of the internal tri triangle of humanity, society, and capitalism in world ecology. So the novel depicts how environmental, socioeconomic, and political collapse are intertwined. Like the disturbing environment and the nature, the government and the power are captured and controlled by the harsh regime of civil reorganization led by authority who created military force, police force. It was un-British, but American. The authority, big capital America, takes the control under its country under its control after the collapse. This epileptic narrative portrays a dystopian capitalist future of Britain, which is now little more than a depending colony of the United States, from which food and fuel are imported. The brand of the tuna fish that Sister East explains this situation better. Quote, the American and British flags flip in opposite directions from the same flag, flag pole. Lord keep us from the forces of evil, bless our sacred liberty, and let those in darkness find your light. God save the king. Unquote. Terrorist attacks hit the country. The, the city had been polluted. The oil runs out. House prices increased because of the insurance scandals. Economic crisis reached the peak point with the collapse of the market and recession. Jobs were lost. The control of food, energy, and reproductivity made the people silent slaves. Since the socioeconomic life was corrupted, the health system went upside down. The health system cracked apart. Epidemics swept through the quarters in every town and cities. There were new viruses too aggressive to threat, unquote. There's a new life entered a new epoch after the collapse makes life conditions very hard. The survival of humanity is getting lost. The overdose and suicide rates climbed. 
The novel depicts that collapse economy is the main reason of bio biopolitical governance of women's bodies by controlling the productivity of women. The authority holds by a power which, quote, is a form of power that regulates social life from its interior, unquote. Thus, what the Reed regime, American regime, is directly at stake in power is the production and reproduction of life itself, unquote, Foucault. The father authority has seized control of the bodies of women in terms of fertility by giving the right to be your children with the lottery. So I argue that the green arithmetic of dystopian Britain is transformed towards an inhabitable environment in which women are subordinated and suppressed by father authority of capital and power. Capital and women's bodies are interrelated to the relation between the land and the climate change. Both land and women's bodies are used, abused, and controlled. So a woman's body becomes a sexual meta abused by the power slash authority, just as land. Then the doctor feeds the coil in the vagina of sister, called inserting the speculum and attaching the device as efficiently as a former clipping, as a farmer clipping the ear of one of his herd, unquote. The novel depicts that women under the authority of power are driven like sheep clipped not by their ears, but by their vaginas, so that not to escape from the patriarchal control of reproductivity. Sister revolts to this corrupted by a political and biocapitalist governance of the authority, which abuses women's bodies as controllable by objects and leaves her oppressed identity name, rapist husband, and corrupt life that, quote, becomes life become, becomes object of political governance and caught by patriarchy behind. The future time zone in the novel is uncertain, moving back and forward within the future that witnesses economic collapse, capital, consumerism, environmental disaster, global warming, ecosystem damage, ecological health system corruption and worse. Harvey calls the need a pact to listen as a kind of time place for learning to stay with the trouble of living and dying in responsibility on a damaged earth, unquote, which has multiple voices of both human and non-human. I agree with her rejection of a certain categorizing timing of ge geographical epoch, as I argue time and space are simultaneously fragile, blurred, and uncertain. Carhulian women learn to stay with trouble in the time of to listen, past, present, and to come. Harvey criticizes the Anthropocene as a capitalist in sound like a pessimist tone of game over, too late attitude. Instead, the area that Tulisin is, quote, made up of ongoing multi species stories and practices of becoming within time that remain at stake in precarious times in which the world is not finished yet and the sky had not fallen yet, unquote. Harvey asserts that the earth is full of refugees, human or not, without refuge, unquote. To transfer into the next epoch, the time of Tulisan is depicted in a different way that women refugees from environmental disaster and the ab abusive regime of authority power come together in the Karholian army to live in balance and harmony with what is left from non-human nature through resisting against the oppressive environment, environmental policies of the dictator regime. The ability of the woman as life-giving is connected to the capacity of Earth as giver of all life, the mother. However, as a myth of Gaia, the mother Earth takes revenge when her body is destroyed, and so she becomes a destroyer. Mythological figures for mother Earth goddesses like Gaia, Rhea, Sibylle, Medusa, and so many others symbolize the creator of life, but also the demoniac destroyer or killer. I argue that Gaia, as the most well-known representative of the Mother Earth, is angry, white, and uncontrollable living organism, whose primary responsibility is not only caring and nurturing, but also torturing and punishing its inhabitants, who try to devalue her natural body by sending chaos to the humanity, such as storms, viruses, foods, earthquakes, and other natural disasters. The flood is maybe the tears of the earth that we should read the message and hear the cries of the world, the mother nature, Gaia, and the stop the destruction. The bacterial smell of refinery and fuel plants are surrounding the constantly with the smoke of rape and tar sand burning off, and all of us packed tightly together like fish in a smoking shed. This scene describes environmental destruction through personification as if nature is a woman who is raped by the smoke of the capital, thus in this scene Mother Earth is raped by the male-oriented pollution and industrial machines, such as as a result of Father Authority's capitalist power.
personification of nature is also seen when sister was captured and put into an iron metal tank and she feels she was caught in the mouth of an iron woman her teeth were close around me and she was ca ca carrying me back to her dance of rag metal in the mountains i heard the creaking of her legs as she strode like panels of metal beating in the wind unquote. the metal iron woman symbolizes mother earth whose nature was disrupted and kept captured by the capitalist industry like women whose bodies are captured in metal coins Hall portrays an apocalyptic dystopian future of Earth with the image of dying planet, the air which is filled with the petrochemical emissions and the road of uncollected rubbish. Petrochemicals give harm both the fertility of women and to the nature, that the land and women's body are polluted by those metals, gas and chemicals. Many women escape from torture, violence, rape and murder to find hope for freedom and to release their anger. So this ecological farm becomes a place for rehabilitation for them. Nature becomes a hope for them. Women in this pastoral commune become stronger to fight for their freedom to get their rights, land and future back and they revolt to change the system of patrons. The Olympian goddess Gaia represents a new state of nature beyond living organism, and humans are as a reference to a Gaia hypothesis formulated by British chemist James Lovelock and American microbiologist Lynn Marcus in 1972. Gaia is introduced as a new figure of nature, or the poetic system, a living planet and a single organism that can change life on itself. Gaia code was once at once gentle, feminine and nurturing, but also ruthless cruel to those who transgressed, like non innocent monsters. Following the myth, we see the same dying type of women like the daughters of Gaia, that the Kahulian women are great warriors who are called a witch by the patriarchal society. They were nuns, religious freaks, communist convicts, they were child deserters, men haters, kunk liquors, they were just as had been hundreds of years ago, witches up to no good in the sticks. They are even labeled as a gang of bloody terrors. The mythological anger of Mother Earth is portrayed with this speech of sister. Women are naturally just as violent, like the daughter of Mother Earth, Jackie, the leader of the commune, has also nurturing and caring side and the brutal and cruel side at the same time. Filled with anger, her brutal side surfaces, putting her army in line. She says, we have begun used to be waiting, hoping to be saved, hoping those in charge will reform and reform us. Sisters, no one is going to help us. There is only us. So why not here? Why not now? They attack the authority with their guns and bombs. However, in the end, they fail and lose many women on the battlefield. Sister is arrested and put into the prison, but her last statement at the court also passes the, her hopes for women and nature in the future. Their bravery will not be forgotten, and others will follow them. This is just the beginning, unquote. The novel gives the message that the struggle of daughters of Mother Earth has just started with plants a seed of hope in the hearts of women under the suppressive control of father authority. There is hope within darkness, it is green within faded dystopia. So ca catastrophic fate of earth will not change unless the patriarchal capitalist regime is over. So humanity should learn to stay with trouble, both human and non-human, I mean nature, require each other in unexpected collaborations and combinations, we become with each other and not at all hurry for. We should pay attention not to annoy or upset our upset our Mother Earth anymore, who already started to take revenge by sending coronavirus to trade capitalist father authority. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we will move on to Kathy and then ask Nalo, Professor Hopkinson to respond to both and then we'll open it up for questions. I seem to have disappeared here. Let me show my face. Um, and so now we turn to Kathy Thomas, who is a postdoc here at UCR and this is her shared PowerPoint. Kathy? Um. myself. Can you hear me now? Yeah? Okay, good. Thank you. Um, yes, my name is Kathy Thomas and I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the um, Creative Writing Department. Uh, my research and writing broadly focuses on um, the African diaspora, specifically um, carnival um, 
like Caribbean, Caribbean cultural um, practices such as carnival, and I also focus on speculative and fantasy writing. Um, this paper was to be presented at the um, Multi-Ethnic Literatures Conference in New Orleans. Um, Milos's 2020 theme, Awakenings and Reckonings, Multi-Ethnic Literature and Effecting Change, Past, Present, and Future, sought to highlight and discuss how literature has responded to and effected change in past, present, and future imagined and, man and manifested spaces. In the spirit of the call and within this paper, I turn to the comics genre as a creative site for examining critical cultural crossings of bodies um, that although socially omitted, are materially and symbolically essential to imagined and manifested futures. Because of the slight change in the format between this conference and last conference, um, this version is abridged by way of close readings and shorter theoretical discussions. Okay, so advancing my slide. Okay, I see. In this talk, I focus on Black female protagonists in Nalo Hopkinson's Post Katrina um, comic House of Whispers and Jeremy Love's comic um, Jim Crow era comic Bayou. Their respective protagonists index a mode of Black survival in places of political and spiritual desiccation. Hopkinson's Voodoo Loa and Love's Young Girl are sense making of and way making through unstable spaces that bleed through and across dreams and reality across sublime joys and unbearable losses. Because textual and graphical elements on a comic book page can bleed out across live slash safe areas of a page and outwards to the edges, I analyze pages as phantasmagoric landscapes that are metaphors of black beingness that is experienced outside of conventional language and logics. The beingness emerges through protagonists as overzealous, even sloppy navigation of that space. They challenge the finitude of social circumstances and the specific circumstances that they, um, that I'm connecting in these two texts are death and dying, which I respectively um, understand as social death and actual death. death. Thus, the phantasmagoric elements in both of these texts create an analytical lens and an archive of being that offers a critique of black survival as a foundation of care in its various forms, rather than survival as a result of the essentialized traits of a mythic black hero um, who overcomes her continental extraction, her capitalist enslavement, further continental extraction, and then her subsequent capitalist disenfranchisement. By focusing on black female protagonists who disrupt both stable and unstable spaces and who move through multiple temporalities, this paper argues that black women's bodies also functions as sites of change and variation over space and time within social racial order. Having the ability to both acknowledge their past and imagine futures that resist the naturalizing of Black suffering draws me to Christina Sharp's articulation of wake and wake work. She articulates, to be in the wake is to live in the nose, to live in the no space that the law is not bound to respect, to live in no citizenship. So to do wake work is to labor in a space of paradoxes. I connect wake work in both comics since the paradox of living beyond black mortality and black death is foundational to both of the comic storylines. The textual and graphic manipulation of pages make it possible to conceive of events as simultaneously fantastic and realistic given the scale of historic, sociopolitical, and bodily trauma experienced textually and intertextually. Thus, a study on the phantasmagoric landscape in House of Whispers and Bayou makes it possible to reconceive Black women's bodies as being constitutive of productive, disruptive paradoxes. Thinking back to last summer when Sheriff Somerset paid her $3 to dive into the swampy river to retrieve the mutilated, lynched, and drowned body of young Billy Glass, 12-year-old Lee Wagstaff proclaims, the bayou is bad, Ain't nothing good ever happened around there. 
Jeremy Love's graphic novel Bayou begins in the fictional deep south of Karen, Mississippi. Set in 1930s, it is fraught with oppressive and intimidating provincialism, where lynching is seen as justice for, wh for whistling at a white woman. Here, Billy Glass is intertextually linked to Emmett Till. Later, when Lee's father is wrongfully accused of killing, of kidnapping um, Lily, Lee's young white friend, Lee is compelled to return to the bayou um, to start a daunting and haunting task to trek through a hole in the bottom of the swamp where she encountered Billy Glass's soul. Lee is mortally wounded after she traverses Karen to go into this fantasy Dixieland but she's, she's temporarily healed by the roots work of a swamp monster called Bayou. Bayou is a man or a once was man who has children, but we don't see his children. We only see them in flashbacks, sometimes as contemporaries to Lee who wear uh, denim coveralls and other times they're shackled as slaves in another timeline. Could be past, could be present, future, it's just not clear. The bay Bayou not only embodies the melancholic space of loss for which he is named, but he becomes to signify slave memory, history, and trauma. Not only is Bayou mourning the loss of his children, but he is mourning the loss of time. His melancholic temporality has a capacious past and a very atrophied future. We see a slight attitude change, or we just see him start to change his attitude um, when he begins to care for a wounded Lee who accidentally impales herself, tripping, um, into, tripping and falling into a, um, a hog snare ditch. Here is an example of a bleeding. Bayou's root work self um, requires mixing of his own blood. The bleed or the act of emerging beyond one's edges is still tentative though, because we can see that it is drawn within the grid of this comic panel, so the blood is being contained. However, on the next page, the effects of his care show up as a um, show up spatially and the situation bleeds through and Lee is situated here between life and death and varying levels of wakefulness as she talks to Billy Glass. You dead, Lee, but she objects, saying that the monster is fixing her up. In fact, the fact of her death is an acknowledgement of an ongoing formation of white supremacist domination that spreads across Karen, Mississippi into the fantasy Dixieland, Neverland. So I don't attribute Lee's heroism to a classic can-do spirit um, reacting to adversity. Rather, Lee's heroism is more akin to survival tactics that have already been pre-programmed to mitigate her half-dead, half-livingness because Karen's and Mississippi's um, and this fantasy, um, fantasy Neverland's domains of meaning, grammar, and law are defined against the Black body, which come into being in this particular landscape through a repertoire of violence. Far from being naturalized by this violence, Lee is an antagonistic and an agentive subject who gets herself into difficult situations. Her mishaps, her clumsiness, encourages Billy and Bayou to shift out of their way of being to help her, to care for her by way of giving her advice or administering medicine. And we see that these acts of care slowly move them beyond their own overdetermined um, depths into active futures. Now, I don't know how Bayou actually ends because uh, Jeremy Love has not resolved uh, the ending or maybe the project hasn't been released yet, but I still enjoy putting this text on my syllabus um, for its ability to introduce um, figurative language to my students. Love's metaphors and metonyms situate and cite human phenomena, racist, um, human racist phenomena um, that allow students to unpack meaning for themselves. Um, so this is an example. So in Bayou's um, parallel magical world, his subjugation is restaged with the grammar of carnivorous um, Jim Crows that attack his flesh. Um, and these crows de and rematerialize across surfaces in Bayou's fantasy and reality. And we can see here that in the actual Mississippi, I think this is actually the first panel of the first book, we see sort of the metaphor of Jim Crows with the, the black uh, crow sitting on top of this sign that is uh, basically expressing the politics of Jim Crow in Mississippi in the 1930s, right? So the formation of the Jim Crows sometimes um, is instigated by an off-page voice of an unseen political voice of someone named Boss Man, and they are also constitutive of Dixieland folk figures. 
So here's an example of a folk figure who provides meta commentary or, you know, in other words, um, Jeremy Love is throwing a little shade onto Disney's Uncle Remus from Songs of the South. As you can see, if you've ever seen Disney's Songs of the South, the picture's almost drawn to, to kind of match the actual photographic image of the actor. Um, Uncle Remus is actually a murderer for hire named Stagel Lee, um, who shapeshifts in this scene to entice Lee to jump off a cliff. Um, also in this scene, special attention is placed to her, her freshly hot combed hair that is flowing in the wind. Disney's Remus appear, appearance is coupled with a specific example of Black aesthetics that is arguably an aspirational, a similist image of Black beauty. It is a fantasy within a fantasy landscape. Lee stands in a hillside with her natural hair that has turned after she, you know, fell into the water. So, you know, her pretty hair has now kind of coiled back, as we can see with Uncle Remus's hand on her shoulder. More can be said about Black hair care and its ability to flatten out or curl back into soft cloths of chaos um, as one way that the text entangles suffering with survival so that neither is contingent and resolvable through processes of, simul of assimilation. However, in House of Whispers, the entanglement between suffering and survival plays out equally in both the real and the dream space of modern day Louisiana. Instead of the challenge of Lee's stubborn livingness in a state of her act of dying, the reverse is staged in New Orleans when people are, infecting, are infected with a waking sickness that creates a living death which separates the human body from its soul. They are alive but walk around as apathetic, soulless shells. This condition is infectious and transmitted by touch. And the words, um, can you feel it when I do this? So that's sort of what completes the infection from person to person. It spreads beyond New Orleans and throughout the world. It, it's in Jakarta, it's in Asia, it's in Europe. So on many levels, the plot like a virus is carried across geographic borders and landscapes. As a visual analog to the failures of containment, House of Whispers make use of page bleeds. Whispers has a style of dream telling that connects to the larger narrative of Neil Gaiman's Sandman from which it emerges as one of four intertextual storylines. We begin on Louisiana Bayou houseboat of Urzuli Freda, a female loa from the Haitian African pantheon who also crosses over into the Louisiana voodoo pantheon. Urzuli provides insights and grants wishes to her worshipers who are asleep in the waking world, but visit her, who have the ability to visit her in the dreaming realm. Urzuli's ceremony and celebration is disrupted when a book of rumors um, belonging to her nephew, Shakpana, who is a, lo uh, a loa or a deity of disease and cure, is found by four human girls in Louisiana. So reciting hearsay from the book, you know, rumors, allows Shakpana to infect one of the girls and it thus it widens the gap between the dream and um, the waking world. So this third space is where souls are trapped and through which Urzuli travels to undo his wicked meme game. Victims of the waking death experience dis-ease, an overwhelming numbing and assimilative mood. Their body is no longer a site of social participation or experience. In the waking human world that contrasts Urzuli's dream space, infection means people no longer see themselves as participants in shared social and political life. Which brings me to the two-part storyline in issues seven and eight, which are titled The Troubles I've Seen, and which is also the title of this talk. The play on the word see or seen and sight moves um, from a woman who's experiencing nightmares of um, developing a taste for eating um, human eyeballs to the eyes that are on the body of, of the trickster spider Anansi to experiences of um, being told by the predeceased victims um, of the notorious uh, slave holding uh, serial killer named um, Madame Lalauri. So this is an actual uh, woman who tortured um, her, her slaves, um, her enslaved people in the, in the 19th century. The phantasmagoric landscape becomes an archive holding textual remains, visual images, recorded and remembered sounds and other material traces that do the work of commemorating capacious and horrific pasts. More specifically, the suffering and survival of souls trapped in Madame Lalaurie's slaver's mansions connect to the living death experienced by modern people afflicted by the waking death. 
In addition, Shakpana chooses to ride. He goes into the body of a human who he's infected, but this man also thinks he's a zombie. And so he proceeds to be, to, you know, perform flesh eating zombie tasks in, in the real waking world. Shakpana chooses the site of Madame Lalari's mansion to quote, cure the man and then the world because it is symbolic, even hyperbolic of suffering. Thus when infected people regain their souls through a cure, they will regain consciousness of all the things they did. Consciousness or being woke will magnify their suffering through remorse, shame and disgust. Whereas Lee's antagonist and agent of behavior elicits care from others that in turn help rebuild the bayou as a space of survival, Urzuli's experiences between worlds is more nuanced. First, Urzuli is an unfixed figure who can shift between three sister aspects of herself. She can be Urzuli Freda, the flirtatious uh, mistress of love, Urzuli Dantor, mother sister figure, and then the vengeful Urzuli Red Eye. She is associated with water and fluidity and embodies an apt metaphor for the spatial expansion of narrative. Urzuli's aspects either facilitate or hinder spatial reordering of the waking world, dream world, and the gap between. So when attempts to rescue the world needs, um, so when attempts to rescue the world means she needs to rescue her nephew. In order for Azuli to repair the world, she needs to re slash pair the idea of antagonism vis-a-vis -vis her her nephew who is the actual embodiment of contagion slash cure and survival slash um, suffering in this way shakpana elicits care from um, Urzuli, even though there is no possibility of altering his predicament or his personality. Care comes in the form of storytelling, a storytelling contest between Anansi and Urzuli. Because Shakpana emerges spiritually and imaginatively as part of the fabric of Black diasporic world, Urzuli's efforts are examples, in my opinion, of wake work. Sharp articulates wake work to be articulates the wake articulates to be in the wake is also to recognize the ways we are constituted through and by vulnerability to overwhelming force though not only known to ourselves and to each other by that force so to do wake uh, work again is a labor within the space of such paradoxical uh, forces the uh, waking sickness spreads as a plague from New Orleans across borders into the world. Similarly, um, Bayou's plague of white supremacy inundates fantasy and reality spaces. So what I'm left to consider about phantasmagoric landscapes pulls me now outside of the pages of comic books into my readerly reality of Louisiana from, country, from Hurricane Katrina floods, um, Cancer Alley toxins, um, to the COVID pandemic that's spreading to Mississippi monuments being being removed and, and being protested. Um, questions that I have are, does the supernatural black slash human relationship take for granted questions of citizenship? Is blackness and beingness exclusively determined outside of limitations of the larger narrative of humanity? If not, does survival and suffering, does the survival suffering paradox frustrate enough the naturalizing of social death as a practice? Is an elaboration on gender, my elaboration specifically, um, of black female bodies that are easily incorporated in a position and sphere of subversive power through basic assumptions and fantasies about their co-recognition and belonging enough to dampen the force of vulnerability in communities? Um, so while crossing of boundaries to recover the dead and the dying is a creative and contentious practice well suited to the preternatural girl or to the God, to do wake work as the humans we are will be an act of recovering ourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. So now we, uh, move to Professor Hopkinson, who has, will have comments, and then we'll open it up to the rest of you. Okay, here I am. Thank you both um, for a couple of provocative um, presentations. 
And I should say that I was not originally going to be the respondent for this because I am, in part because I am working with Kathy um, in the creative writing department, but here I am and very happy to be here. Um, what struck me about both presentations is the ways in which they look at women's bodies, women's lives, women's reactions to the various catastrophes that we create, the various planetary catastrophes that we create as human beings. Um, we bleed over our, we bleed beyond our edges. We live beyond our deaths. We hope beyond despair. Um, and that both um, presentations brought this into the room, the virtual room that we are in. Um, I enjoyed that they both resist simplicity. So complicating the idea of Gaia as both um, the, 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 the being that nurtures the world and the being that enacts vengeance when, when we, we take things too far. Um, Gaia is both protagonist and antagonist. Uh, comp uh, complicating the idea, saying that women, reminding us that women being human can be violent, sloppy, overzealous. Um, so both deal with women's survivance through our caused various scenes, uh, planetary deaths, um, and at least have the hope of if we survive, we can save the rest of the world. Women doing work, women doing wake work. Um, one thing I would say to Sumeria is that uh, something that's kind of implied in your presentation is um, uh, um, a binary, a binary of um, gender and a binary of um, sexuality. And I would enjoy it if you would either explore those a little bit more or raise them as questions. Because the, the novel that you're talking about divides the world into straight and that's all there is. And um, women and men or women as being child bearers um, versus not. Um, see where else my notes go. This respondent thing is a work of art under pressure in itself. <laughs> All right, that's my, that's my summary. Basically, the idea of living beyond surviving beyond the idea of uh, women's bodies as being one of the sites of um, resisting what we as humans are doing to ourselves and to the planet. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to open it up now for um, questions from those of you who are here. I think we're a small enough group that you can just uh, kind of raise your hand on online um, or if you want to pose a question through the chat function. I think I can deal with that too. Are there questions or comments? How about responses from our panelists to Professor Hopkinson's remarks? Yeah. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor Hopkinson, for your valuable comments. And I, I think both papers are in a way related to each other in terms of body, woman body and rebellion. Um, for your question, uh, yes, women in this novel, they try to create a single sex society. So there is a binary between two societies. But for me, from my perspective, both societies have the same kind of dictatorship. I mean, women in the single society, they also suffer from that, that kind of authoritative regime that it, in the end, they find themselves in a very bad situation that they couldn't uh, fight for their rights. So uh, what I get from the novel is that uh, in the end, uh, relating to Haraway's philosophy of Tulasin is 
uh, past, present, or future, both men and women, or human and nature, we should uh, only be, uh, we can be happy if we can reunite <laughs> in a peaceful world. Yes, thank you so much, Nalo, for your comments. And I, I was I was definitely taking down notes between uh, the similarities, and I, and I do have some questions for Sumeria. Um, of thinking through like humanism and the idea of the capital of scene. But uh, to Professor Hopkinson's um, comments on our, on our, uh, the connection of both of our papers, um, what I did um, appreciate about the, 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 the work or the, the woman's work or the disruption of, of um, sort of the disruption of like a binarism or the attempt um, to disrupt the binarism. One of the things that I am aware of and why I really do like to um, work with comics is that comics are sort of an active, an, an active sort of textual space because the way that they are published and produced, they take time. Oh, well, you know this because, you know, it takes time to complete that. And in between, um, like uh, writing the story, inking, uh, drawing, coloring, painting, life and world is happening. And that actually is another sort of meta layer of bleeding into it. And I often think about how, um, how uh, the wake work that I'm thinking about that is happening in both of these novels, um, for all I know, could have been informed um, through conversations or actual reading of Christina Sharp's work, of Black thought, of Black studies, um, I know I've heard uh, Jeremy Love talk about um, about his work as a sort of active living, almost biographical, genealogical uh, project where he is bringing his own family and those narratives into the story. So I think that um, the idea of of space, whether it's the planet or these Black women's bodies that are moving between spaces that are being corrupted on the planet. Because I, I, I'm thinking now of New Orleans and just the number of people who are infected with COVID virus, right? So there, there had to have been crazy capitalist steps that were taken to get to that point, right? Before we even get to the dystopic post-apocalypse, you know, that might happen. So I don't know, I just, it just makes me sort of think about comics as a genre, as um, in the literary like category as wake work for literature itself, you know? I like that, thank you. Anyone else, comments? Yes. Yeah, I may ask a question to Kathy about uh, her presentation uh, she mentioned that comics are a good way of, of making a uh, woman or some kind of rebellion. So, and you mentioned about the situation of black women in terms of captured by coronavirus, but without any care. So, do you think that uh, black women or black bodies are two times or three times um, captured by the authority or the capital? I mean, first by the white, second by the uh, white females, and third by the black men? Um, I think that is, um, that's definitely a line of thought that, um, that I work through when I'm, when I read um, uh, some of, uh, you know, some of the, the work that I'm, I'm going through reading side by side, like I'm reading, you know, um, uh, so your question definitely makes me think of uh, Tiffany King's uh, Black Shoals, where she is actually uh, thinking about uh, the Black women, uh, Black female bodies as being instrumental in colonial and in settled or colonial and, exp and, and, and sort of geographic expansion of the West, because they were a sort of a site, um, like a, a Black women's bodies, because they were made to reproduce labor are, are actual like quantifiable units um, that could be mapped onto space, you know. Um, so, and yet, you know, we would then think about um, Hortense Spiller's 
um, talking about the ungendering of female black bodies. And then you can, you know, look at other people. So all of these things, um, yeah, all of these things coalesce. So I, I can, I see, I do see um, that point that you're making. And um, I do want to trouble it with uh, reading wake work into uh, George Harriman's crazy cat, which is a cartoon strip from the, from 1908. And the cat is genderless but it's in love with a male mouse and it sort of t takes on this interesting, like, uh, I don't know if it's a heteronorma or a homosocial re love relationship, but it's really interesting to think of its black body because it's a black cat um, being either triply captured or, ref or refusing to be captured triply. I think Professor Hopkinson had a comment. Mm, yes. Um, it's so weird being called Professor Hopkinson. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Nalo is fine. Um, so I realized that one of the things that, that caught my imagination about Sumeria's presentation, um, Sumeria is the, as you move through the various, from the Anthropocene to the Capitalocene, and it was the first time I was hearing these terms, to the Cthulhucene, one of the complications and messinesses that, that comes about is we move through genres. Uh, so we move from the Anthropocene, which is sort of the ecological science fiction, capitalocene being what is disaster movie. <laughs> and by the time you get to Cthulhu scene, you're in straight up horror. Um, the, the idea that we are, we are, whatever we do, it's messy. There's, there's, we try to confine it to, the, to, to boundaries, but it isn't. Um, and also to respond to Kathy about wake work, it struck me that Jeremy Love and his brother worked on Bayou, and I think one and two were out. It's three that's never come out. Um, so two black men working on Bayou. Um, the I was the only woman working on House of Whispers. So that this wake work told through the stories of women's and girls' bodies is also multi-gendered. Um, in, in ways that it's useful to remember um, and intriguing to think about. That's not a question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did, for Sumeria, I had a, I was really like, I have always wanted to like read and think more about the Capitalocene. I, I'm so fascinated by it because it feels like that is like, a, almost like it is okay so i i wrote down like some thoughts it was the convergence of man-made wealth driven agents that undoes that if that undoes the planet and then it makes a way to, for the cthulhu scene i'm wondering could the cthulhu scene actually be a liberatory moment where um so there's a third the theorist that i'm i i i work through i'm working through a lot of sylvia winters and she basically says that um uh the humans or humanity is an overrepresentation of man. And I'm thinking when you were talking about the novel and the idea of man, not necessarily gendered man, but man who is like, you know, um, the enlightened man, the homo economicus man, the man that's gonna like pollute the air to, you know, to, to buy a Rolex watch man. Like, could the Cthulhu scene be a good thing? Yeah, I certainly agree with you. Yeah, it, it might be a good thing and a liber liberative uh, activities uh, for both uh, human and non-human. So for, for the Catalyst in time, I don't know if we are in that or not, or we will be. Uh, Harvey uh, claims that we need to learn how to live with the trouble. So both, uh, both men and human, or in the future, human and non-human. So uh, maybe it will uh, eliminate the binaries or it will uh, give birth to more uh, multi or multi uh, species, species or binaries. So uh, we cannot see the future, but it seems that Catalysine uh, is more uh, optimistic way of see, seeing the future. That sounds good. <laughs> Other comments?
questions? Well, I think we should thank our panelists and thank our respondent and thank you for all of you coming. And this has been great. And now I want to order the books, but I can't order anything on Amazon today, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to wait. Why, why is that? Is Amazon freezing orders today? No, it's um, a strike. A strike oh. of Amazon workers. So we're not yeah. good for them. Right. Yeah. Maybe wow. <laughs> Wow. No wonder I got all my orders yesterday. I was like, this is supposed to come until Saturday. Like, I just got like five trucks showing up with books. I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah. And I would like to thank Dr. Georgia and uh, Professor Hopkinson and the others uh, for joining this and especially for you for organizing such kind of great uh, event that like combining great. all of us together. Well, we also have it, uh, we've recorded it, so It'll be up on our website and your friends and family and anyone can. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, we can share it maybe on social media. <laughs> <laughs> Let's edit it a little bit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's edit but, out my comments. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, and my yogurt eating. Oh, you eating yogurt? <laughs> but you're the protagonist, so it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you All so right. much Thanks for showing all. up, everyone. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Bye.